the year 2027 in Daniel 12. The people of God need to study what characters they must form in order to pass through the test and proving of the last days. Many are living in spiritual weakness and backsliding. They know not what they believe. Let us read and study the twelfth chapter of Daniel. It is a warning that we shall all need to understand before the time of the end, Ellen G. White, Manuscript Releases, Volume 15, 228. The traditional interpretation of Daniel 12 verses 11 to 12. Even for Adventist scholars and experts in the field of prophesies, Daniel 12 seems to be difficult to find a clear application. For this reason, some of them prefer to avoid it in order to prevent a possible incorrect interpretation. The best example is the excellent book by Clifford Goldstein, 1844 Made Simple, which deals with all the chapters of the book of Daniel, except chapter 12. Another popular Adventist source suggests that 1290 and 1335 days per year in Daniel 12 verses 11 to 12 are probably related to the 1260 day prophecy, and therefore, they may just overlap each other. It also concludes that, there is no official view from our denomination on the 1290 and 1335 days. Therefore, for now, some observations must come from continued personal research. In recent years some Seventh-day Adventists began applying the time periods in Dan 12 colon 5-13 to the future, claiming that the three and a half times, the 1290 and 1335 days, as prophetic periods can be also understood as literal days still to come. Others tend to interpret the time periods of Dan 12 as merely a literary technique that suggests an apparent delay of the time of the end. There are also those who believe that these prophecies could have more than one interpretation, and that it is not possible to state with certainty how they were to be fulfilled. The typical dates assigned by Adventist interpreters to these two prophetic time periods, found in Daniel 12 verses 11 to 12, are 508 for the 1290 days per year and 508 1843 for the 1335 day a year period. As a starting point for these prophecies, the year 508 AD was chosen to fit the time frame until 1798 and 1843. The date refers to the converted to Catholicism French King Clovis. I who in 508 AD was supposed to assume the role of defender of the Catholic faith. However, these dates don't seem to be very convincing because Daniel 12 is an epilogue for the entire book of Daniel, and clearly refers to the very end time, resurrection, and second advent. Therefore these two last prophetic periods should be linked with the very end of the final events. We can see this idea in Daniel 12 in the specific words used there. Expressions such as, time of trouble, the final persecution of God's people, your people shall be delivered, those who sleep shall awake, seal the book until the time of the end, clearly tell us that this chapter goes beyond the year 1843 reaching the very end time events and the second advent. According to Strong's Concordance, the word end used here refers to extremity, border, final, and edge. Therefore, the time periods found in Daniel 12 verses 11 to 12 should refer to the end of the world's history and not merely the year 1843. The new historic interpretation leading to the year 2027. It also looks reasonable that 1,335 years, instead of overlapping the 1,290-year period, should be added to it. It makes sense as according to the context, these two verses, Daniel 12 verses 11 to 12, deal with the very end of the world's history, and when we add these two long prophetic periods, the date we receive actually embraces the end-time events, possibly including the second advent. 
like the end of the book of Revelation also the end of the book of Daniel must point to the time of Christ's return. The book of Revelation ends up with the words, Surely I am coming quickly. Amen, come, Lord Jesus. Likewise, the final verses of the book of Daniel refer to the same, blessed, event and not merely to time periods and dates already dealt with in the previous chapters of the book of Daniel. The answer was given to Daniel's question, what shall be the end of these things? The expression, these things, refers to the events that were to take place long after 1843, including especially the final persecution of God's people known as the, time of trouble, Daniel 12 verse 1. It is obvious that Daniel wanted to know the answer to the same question Christ's disciples asked him regarding the end of the world and his return. This argument is evidence that the answer Daniel received in the form of the prophetic periods had to lead to the final events. Therefore, the combination of 1290 day and 1335 day time periods should refer to the blessed event of the second advent, the deliverance of God's people, and the resurrection, including Daniel's resurrection. In addition, Daniel was already given the explanation related to the years 1798 and 1844 in the previous chapters. He didn't need merely a repetition of basically the same prophecy. He wanted to know more about the time of the end of the last persecution of God's people and Christ's return. The word, blessed. In Daniel 12 verse 13 can be another evidence that the prophetic periods used here should end at the second advent, and the resurrection of the believers, because the word, blessed, is associated with the happiness of experiencing Christ's return, salvation, and inheriting heaven at the second advent. In Matthew 5 verses 3 to 11 Christ uses the word, blessed, nine times, and in most cases, it means, Inheriting the kingdom of heaven, v. 3, 5, 10, seeing God, v. 8, and inheriting the earth, v. 5. As previously mentioned, Adventist interpreters claim 508 AD as the starting date of this prophetic period. At that time the question of supremacy between the Catholic and Arian branches of Christianity was settled in favor of. Catholicism by the subjection of the Arian tribes by Clovis, king of the Franks. Using the day for a year rule, Numbers 14.34 and Ezekiel 4 verse 6, this makes the 1290 days, years, end in 1798, at the same time as the 1260 days per years. If we start the 1335 days at the same time, 508 AD, it brings us to 1843, very near the year 1844 which is the end of the 2300 days per years of Daniel 8 verse 14. The truth, however, is that the event claimed to be the beginning of those prophetic periods doesn't seem to match the description of the starting point because, at that time the daily sacrifice was supposed to be taken away. The subjection of the Arian tribes by Clovis King of the Franks as a starting date for Catholic supremacy doesn't sound like a very convincing match for abolishing the daily sacrifice. Having said that, let us now try to find out if there is a better and more convincing interpretation of the two prophetic periods of Daniel 12 verses 11 to 12, and if this interpretation can refer to the end time. A much more meaningful and significant date than 508 AD for the time of abolishing the daily sacrifices, is the year 599 BC. According to the written by James Usher, 1581-1656, Annals of the World, in 599 BC Nebuchadnezzar's army robbed the temple taking all the treasures, 2 Kings 24 verses 13-14. Also, Harry W. Lowe, Field Secretary of the General Conference, in his 1963 article published in the Ministry magazine seemed to agree with Usher's dating. By the threefold fall of Jerusalem at the hands of King Nebuchadnezzar, 606, 599, 
587 BC, see 2 Chronicles 36 verses 5 to 21. Both Israel and Judah were captives in Babylonia. After the various deportations of the Jews, they were found in three main groups. One large group in Egypt to which they had fled when Jerusalem's fall was imminent in 599 BC or thereabouts, one in Babylonia, and the third in Palestine. Greater than sign, in the introduction to the book of Ezekiel, the popular Jameson Fawcett and Brown commentary states as follows. His, Ezekiel's, call to prophesy was in the fifth year from the date of his being carried away with Jehoiakim. See 2 Kings 24 verses 11 to 15, by Nebuchadnezzar, 599 BC. The best portions of the people seem to have been among the first carried away, EZ 1116, J 24 colon 2, 7, 8, 10. More modern sources, including SDA commentary, however, claim that the event took place in 597 BC thanks to the discovery of an astronomical tablet listing numerous solar, lunar, and planetary phenomena during Nebuchadnezzar's 37th year, we can date to the very day the capture of the Jewish king, Jehoiakim, in Nebuchadnezzar's 8th year, 2 Kings 24 verse 12. The date was March 16, 597 BC, and the final assault appears to have been launched on the Jewish Sabbath. It is interesting that describing that invasion, the Bible doesn't mention anything about the Ark of the Covenant. The second book of the Maccabees, included in the Septuagint, a Greek collection of Jewish scripture, provides the explanation for this mystery. Shortly before the arrival of the Babylonian army, inspired by God prophet Jeremiah removed the Ark from the temple and hid it in one of the caves. 2 Maccabees 2 colon 4-8 tells us that before Babylonians invaded Jerusalem, Jeremiah left the city with three of the holiest temple relics. Those three relics included the sacred tent that was once used as a portable temple, the altar of incense, and the Ark of the Covenant. Jeremiah, being warned by God, commanded that the Ark should be removed from the temple and hidden. When the temple was plundered by the Babylonians the daily sacrifices stopped because it was impossible to continue those sacrifices without the Ark of the Covenant, containing the transgressed by sinners' holy law, and its mercy seat made of gold overlay, the symbol of God's presence. In addition, we read that Nebuchadnezzar carried all Jerusalem into exile, which must have included all priests, because only the poorest people of the land were left, 2 Kings 24 verse 14. Since, because of Israel's continual sin, the temple was plundered and deprived of the ark and God's presence, it practically ceased to exist. For this reason, the daily sacrifices came to an end. They had to be taken away, Daniel 12 verse 11, because in order to be valid, those daily sacrifices required the presence of the transgressed by sinners' holy law of God, hidden in the ark. So David left Asaph and his relatives there before the ark of the covenant of the Lord to minister before the ark continually, as every day's work required, 1 Chronicles 16 verse 37. It doesn't mean that priests entered the most holy place every day as we know it took place only once a year, during the great day of atonement. However, everyday priests entered the holy place with the blood of animals sprinkling the veil in front of the ark without entering the most holy place. Therefore, also for the daily sacrificial service the presence of the transgressed by sinners' holy law was required. Now, having established the start day of 597 BC, or 597 BC, for the first long prophetic period of 1290 days, provided by Daniel 12 verse 11. We must now add to it 1290 years to set the end date of the same period. As a result, we have the year 692 AD. Can this date provide an important event that could be described as the abomination of desolation, and fit the definition given in Daniel 12 verse 11?
Well, when we accept the year 597 BC as the starting date of 1290 years, then the closing date of 692 AD also matches the description of Daniel 12 verse 11. Various reliable historical sources confirm that 692 AD is associated with the completion of constructing the Dome of the Rock. Although according to the Encyclopedia Britannica, the Dome of Rock was built in 685 to 691, greater than sign. Numerous other sources claim the year 692 AD to be more precise, known as the Qubat al sakra to Muslims. Construction on the Dome of the Rock began in 691 CE and finished in 692 CE. This fact perfectly fits the description provided by Daniel who defines that event as another abomination of desolation. Daniel 12 verse 11, because a very hostile to Christianity pagan temple was built on the holy site of God's temple. The second possible date for the abomination of the desolation to take place could be the building of the Al-Aqsa, or Al-Aqsa, mosque on the same holy temple site in Jerusalem. The Al-Aqsa Mosque is one of the two important buildings erected by Muslims on the platform built by Herod the Great. A brief guide to the Dome of the Rock and Al-Haram al-Sharif, published in 1965, says the original Al-Aqsa Mosque was built in AD 693 and later it was reconstructed and enlarged. Greater than sign, the Dome of the Rock is not a mosque but it was built to protect this important site, the Holy Rock. Al-Aqsa, on the other hand, is a mosque and is called such as the place where Muhammad ascended to heaven. Greater than sign, Al-Aqsa Mosque was laid down by Caliph Omar, or Umar, and consecrated in 693. Al-Aqsa Mosque has much larger capacity than that of the Dome of the Rock, which is more an architectural monument than a prayer house. Greater than sign, the Muslims added two dominant structures to the site, the Dome of the Rock, built in 691 CE, that stands in the middle of the mount, directly over the ruins of the inner sanctuaries of the two temples, and the Al-Aqsa Mosque, built in 693 CE, in the southwestern corner of the mount. Greater than sign. Instead of one, we may have two possible dates for the end of the 1290-year period and both options can match the long time of 1290 years. The first and most convincing extends from 597 BC and ends in 692 BC. The construction of the Dome of Rock was finished. The second time application starts in 597 BC and ends in 693 AD. Al-Aqsa Mosque was built on the temple site in Jerusalem. According to Wikipedia and other sources another possible date for the siege of Jerusalem is 598 BC, the Babylonian Chronicles, which were published by Donald Wiseman in 1956, established that Nebuchadnezzar captured Jerusalem the first time on March 16, 597 BC. Before Wiseman's publication, E. R. Thiele had determined from the biblical texts that Nebuchadnezzar's initial capture of Jerusalem occurred in the spring of 597 BC, but other scholars, including William F. Albright, more frequently dated the event to 598 BC. 32. Also the British Museum website states that, in 598 BC the Babylonian army besieged Jerusalem. It fell on 15 16 March 597 BC, 33. Now, since we have dates for the first prophetic period established, let us move to Daniel 12 verse 12 and deal with the second period. Immediately after Daniel was told about 1290 days per year, Daniel 12 verse 11. Another long prophetic period of 1,335 days per year was added to the previous one. Blessed is the one who waits for and reaches the end of the 1,335 days, Daniel 12 verse 12. Some Adventist interpreters, such as Kenneth Cox and Doug Batchelor, T. 
teach that these periods can be also treated as literal days and placed in the future referring to the final events. I believe that even if we still regard them as years, they will still lead us to the final events and the second advent. However, the first period of 1290 years should start in 597 BC, not 508 AD, and end up in 692 AD, while the second period of 1335 years, instead of overlapping the first, should be treated as its continuation. Notice that Daniel was told that blessed is the one who waits for and reaches the end of 1335 days, years, as if to suggest that we are to wait for another 1335 years to reach the blessed time of Christ's return and inherit God's kingdom. What date do we get when we wait another 1335 years from the end of the 1290 year period? As a result, when we count 1,335 years from 692 AD, or add it to the 1,290-year period, it leads us to the year 2027 AD. This interpretation is more convincing because it fits the end-time context, and the scenario of Daniel 12 verses 11 to 13 much better. 1. The daily sacrifice is abolished. 597 BC, the temple was plundered after the Ark of Covenant was removed from it. 2. The abomination of desolation follows 1290 years later, the dome of rock built on the temple ground in 692 AD. 3. After the abomination, 691 AD, we must wait 1335 more years for the blessing. 2027 deliverance of the persecuted Christians, return of Christ, salvation, and resurrection of the believers, including Daniel. The fact that the same year 2027 can be established on the basis of not one but three separate sources, the Jubilee and Sabbatical years, Daniel 12 verses 11 to 12, and the spirit of prophecy should finally wake us up and make us very happy as it increases the probability that this time the return of the Lord is very close indeed. If the year 2027 is correct and if it refers to the second advent then we can expect that the final events should start taking place very soon. The possibility of dual and additional application. Let me share with you a very interesting quote by Arthur Steele. PhD and current Vice President for the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists, in which he surprisingly seems to justify the possibility of a dual application of Daniel 12 verses 11 to 13. Ellen G. White did not get involved in the debate about the physical resurrection of Daniel as presented in the final verse of the book. Instead, using the language of the verse, she applies it to the fact that the prophecies of Daniel have now been more clearly understood. The time has come for Daniel to stand in his lot. The time has come for the light given him to go to the world as never before. If those for whom the Lord has done so much will walk in the light, their knowledge of Christ and the prophecies relating to him will be greatly increased as they near the close of this earth's history. The question remains, does the text itself provide any hint of a possible additional application? Although we do not find any textual justification for the dual fulfillment of the prophetic period mentioned in Daniel 12, verse 12, nevertheless, the wording of Daniel 12 verse 13 seems to point to a possible additional application besides the promise of resurrection given to Daniel himself. The indicator is found in the last word of the passage. For this last word, translated as days, Daniel uses two languages. He starts in Hebrew but ends the word in Aramaic. Although these two languages have the same root for the word days, the Hebrew beginning of the word cannot be mistaken because of the definite article. In Hebrew, the definite article comes as a prefix to the word but in Aramaic, the definite article comes as a suffix to the word. In addition, 
the definite articles in these two languages are unmistakably different. If Daniel had used only Hebrew, it would point back to the word days used in referring to 1,335 days. If Daniel had used only an Aramaic word, it would just clearly and totally differentiate the word days in Daniel 12 verse 13 from the word days used in Daniel 12 verse 12. However, the fact that Daniel combines two languages in the final word may suggest that, although there is a clear distinction between the two passages, there still is some possible connection between them. Ellen G. White, without proficiency in ancient languages, nevertheless saw indicators that allowed her to make a noteworthy contribution in addition to the fulfillment of the promise of a physical resurrection for Daniel himself. Ellen G. White referred to the resurrection of the message of the book of Daniel. We can believe that the same Holy Spirit who guided Daniel in writing his book, guided Ellen G. White in understanding it. 12. Ministry, December 2021. Unfortunately, in the above statement, Arthur Steely does not explain what could be that suggested by him additional application of Daniel 12 verses 11 to 13 and what could be the meaning of the fact that guided by the Holy Spirit Daniel wrote the very last word, days, using two languages. Nevertheless, he seems to be right in suggesting that there is a possible connection between the last verses and also between the two long prophetic periods found in Daniel 12 verses 12 to 13. That double application and the connection between those verses and time periods refer to the fact that these two prophetic periods should be connected, or combined together ending at the time of the blessed return of the Lord, which also includes the day of Daniel's resurrection. Those two periods should be connected in a similar way as Hebrew and Aramaic elements are connected in the final word, days. Ellen White was right in her comment on the last verses of the book of Daniel. Instead of confirming the past singular application suggested by her husband, Uriah Smith, and other authors, she only stated that the knowledge of Christ and the prophesies relating to him, his coming, will be greatly increased as we near the close of this earth's history. Well, her words are being fulfilled now as we enter the last stage of the world's history and experience God's blessing in the current. Resurrection of the message of the book of Daniel, in the form of a deeper understanding of its final part. Time of trouble, for a time, times, and half a time, Daniel 12 verse 7. The more I study Daniel 12, comparing it with other chapters and various Adventist interpretations, the more I am convinced about the possible double application of the three prophetic periods found in Daniel 12 colon 7. 11, 12. On one hand, 1,290 days and 1,335 days can and should be regarded as symbolic years, and combined together lead us to the year 2027 and the second advent. On the other hand, the time, times, and half a time, the same 1,260 days or three and a half years can be treated as literal days and refer to the literal time of the time of trouble just before the second advent. This idea also seems to give us an additional reason why the word days, Daniel 12 verse 13, was written in two languages, instead of one. If we only overlap 1290 and 1,335 year periods of time and count 1,335 years from 599 BC we would have the year 737 AD. However, in the year 737 AD nothing significant happened to justify the solemn words received by Daniel, blessed is the one who waits for and reaches the end of the 1,335 days. Daniel 12 verse 12. The only event that could be associated with the year 737 AD was the battles between the European Franks and the Umayyad Muslims in southeastern France. The Franks destroyed the Umayyad stronghold and ended the advancement of the Islamic faith in Europe. 
Perhaps for some Christians, it could be regarded as a blessing. But the context of verse 12 deals with the time of the end and with the final outcome of the great controversy between good and evil. For this reason, we should expect that verse 12 is dealing with the most blessed hope of Christ's return. No one knows the day or the hour, but maybe God is allowing us to understand the year and perhaps the season. Let us continue studying Daniel 12 and see if we can find more details concerning the timing of the final events. Daniel 12 verse 1 tells us that, there shall be a time of trouble, such as never has been since there was a nation till that time. But at that time your people shall be delivered. There is no doubt that the time of trouble refers to the persecution of God's people before the second coming, while the words, at that time your people shall be delivered, indicate the deliverance of the followers of Christ at his glorious return. The time of trouble from Daniel 12 verse 1 is the same great tribulation mentioned by Christ in Matthew 24 verses 21 to 22. He even used the same language here which leads us to the conclusion that he must have quoted Daniel 12 verse 1. It is interesting that in all three passages, Daniel 7 verse 25, Daniel 12 verse 7, and Revelation 12 verse 14 the persecution of God's people lasts three and a half years, or a time, times, and half a time. This is also 1260 days or 42 months, see Daniel 7 verse 25, Revelation 11 verses 2 to 3. After Daniel was told about the time of trouble and that God's people will be delivered from it, Daniel 12 verses 1 to 2, Daniel was instructed to seal that message until the time of the end, because, as he was informed, at the time of the end God's people will be running to and fro, or repeatedly going through the book of Daniel and other related books, and their knowledge and understanding of the prophecy was to increase. Now, the sealing of the message didn't mean that Daniel was not supposed to receive more details concerning the timing of the final events, but that the three prophetic periods he was about to receive would be understood only by the wise believers living in the very end of world history. And, immediately after that promise was given, Daniel heard the very same question he himself was very eager to ask, how long until the end of these awful things? Jewish Publication Society, Tanakh, The Holy Scriptures If you were Daniel who was told that God's people, your brothers and sisters in Christ, would be persecuted in an awful way, what would you be very eager to know? Because of your empathy for them, love, and your solidarity with them, you would want to know how long time they would suffer like that and when it would end. And lo and behold, the answer was provided immediately after that question was asked. For a time, times, and half a time, Daniel 12 verse 7. The majority of Adventist interpreters claim that the expression, time, times, and half a time, is the same period of 1260 years of the persecution found in Daniel 7 verse 25, and that it proves that the same period of time given in Daniel 12 verse 7 can't refer to the future, but only to the same past period of papal dominance and persecution, 538 AD to 1798 AD. However, even though the prophetic period of Daniel 12 verse 7 seems to be the same as in Daniel 7 verse 25, this time it can't refer to the same year 1798 simply because it wasn't the time of the end of the world's history. Therefore, the expression, time, times, and half a time in Daniel 12 verse 7, should refer to the time of trouble, such as never has been, Daniel 12 verse 1, and the awful persecution, Daniel 12 verse 6, that will take place just before the return of Lord Jesus. And, since the final persecution can't last 1260 years, this time the prophetic period of time, times, and half a time should be treated as a literal time of 1260 days, or three and a half years. 
Since this persecution is to end at the return of Christ, it should start three, five years before the second advent. Therefore, if we assume that Christ may return in autumn 2027 then the persecution time should start in spring 2024, on the condition that this interpretation is correct. If the year 2031 is the right time for the second advent, then the time of trouble should begin in the year 2027 to 2028. It is thought-provoking that although Sister White provides comments and confirmation of the right interpretation of the three, five, year period in Daniel 7 verse 25, she is quiet concerning the same one found in Daniel 12 verse 7. She only tells us to study the twelfth chapter of Daniel and prepare ourselves for an overwhelming surprise, let us read and study the twelfth chapter of Daniel. It is a warning that we shall all need to understand before the time of the end, Ellen G. White, Manuscript Releases, Volume 15, 228. Transgression has almost reached its limit. Confusion fills the world, and a great terror is soon to come upon human beings. The end is very near. God's people should be preparing for what is to break upon the world as an overwhelming surprise, Child Guidance, 555 -1. Ellen White didn't comment or explain any of the three prophetic periods of Daniel 12, including time, times, and half a time, because it wasn't yet the right time for unsealing the three prophetic periods of Daniel 12. It was supposed to take place just before the second advent. Therefore, now is the right time for diligent study, understanding, and unsealing this mystery, by God's grace. Whether the time setting provided here is correct or not, taking into consideration the global medical terrorism we have recently experienced, the global economic crisis, the papal efforts to push Sunday law using the fake climate change hysteria, and global efforts to digitalize the world, there is no doubt that this time the end is really very close. There appears to be a three, five year time of trial and crisis, time of trouble, Daniel 12 verse 1, before the end, as mentioned in Daniel 12 verse 7. Christ also had a 3.5 year period of time for accomplishing his mission, from fall 27 AD to spring 31 AD. This is much like Christ's faithful followers who will be standing for the truth during a 3.5 year period of time, and they will receive the seal of God, but the unfaithful receive the mark of the beast. If the year 2027 is going to be the last year, then it is possible that the three, five years could begin in 2024. Before that time, as soon as the Sunday law is imposed, we must leave cities and move to the countryside a place where we can grow our own food. A country living will help us to survive. If the above calculation is correct, we can expect that between now and 2027, things should get worse and worse, especially for those who keep the commandments of God. The possible time of the second coming of Jesus Christ, the autumn of 2027 AD, will be the start of a year of jubilee that may continue to the autumn of 2028 AD, counting cycles of 50 years from 27 AD, where at the day of atonement of that year of jubilee, which is Yom Kippur, a final trumpet will be blasted after the festival of trumpets. Count off seven Sabbath years seven times seven years so that the seven Sabbath years amount to a period of 49 years then have the trumpet sounded everywhere on the tenth day of the seventh month, on the day of atonement sound the trumpet throughout your land. Consecrate the fiftieth year and proclaim liberty throughout the land to all its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you, each of you is to return to your family property and to your own clan. Leviticus 25 verses 8 to 10. If the year 2027 is going to be the last one then it is possible that the Lord may return in the fall of that year. Around the time of the Feast of Trumpets, Leviticus 23 verse 24, on the first day of the seventh Jewish month, September, October. 
the Feast of Trumpets was pointing to the end of the world and the return of Christ. 1 Thessalonians 4 verses 13 to 18, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. 1 Corinthians 15 verses 51 and 52, For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Matthew 24 verses 30 to 31, Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Symbolic and literal days in Daniel 12, 7, 11, 12. Some Adventist commentators believe in both symbolic and literal application of the prophetic days, found in the book of Daniel and Revelation, meaning that the prophetic periods can be regarded as both years, symbolic days, and literal days. As a result, they support the idea of dual application of the prophetic periods, claiming that as the literal days these prophetic periods refer to the final events, and that such literal interpretation does not nullify the symbolic, historicist, one, but rather completes it. Some time ago Doug Batchelor made a presentation sharing his belief in a double application for the prophetic days of Daniel 12, verses 11 to 12. While still believing in the historical application of 508 AD, 1798 for 1290 days per year and 508 AD, 1833 AD for 1335 days per year of Daniel 12 verses 11 to 12. He claimed that the 1260 days, 1290 days, and 1335 days may very well be literal days and can be applied to the end time events. Although this idea has met some opposition from the proponents of the traditional, historicist, view, I personally wouldn't disqualify this idea by accusing it of being untrue and dangerous. First of all, it doesn't undermine the traditional historicist interpretation of 2300 and 60 days per year. Second, although I am not sure whether Doug Batchelor and other proponents of the literal application are right, I wouldn't categorically disqualify any additional interpretation because I have learned that God's plans and prophesies reveal such incredible wisdom of God and sovereignty that I wouldn't be surprised to discover not only double, but even triple application in Daniel 12 verses 7-13. I believe that the suggested here new historicist interpretation, which combines the two prophetic periods of Daniel 12 verses 11 to 12 instead of overlapping them, and sets their beginning in 599 BC while their end in the year 2027, is the most convincing one. It uses the historicist application and it perfectly agrees with the date of the end set on the basis of the cosmic week theory, Jubilee, and sabbatical years, as well as the statements by Ellen White. Nevertheless, we shouldn't reject any additional interpretation without prayerful investigation. If it turns out to be true, it will only make more meaningful the promise of unsealing the prophecy of Daniel 12 in the time of the end, Daniel 12 verse 9. Those who believe in the dual application claim that the Bible uses different words for literal days and different for symbolic ones. In Dan 7.25 the word, times, was written in Aramaic, in Dan 12.7, times, are in Hebrew, and in Dan 8.14, 26 evenings and mornings, are also in Hebrew. All of them were used to describe prophetic times. As previously discussed, only the word, days, found at the end of Daniel 12 verse 13 is unique and special as this one word was written in both Hebrew and Aramaic. However, the opponents of the literal application argue that the above argument is inconsistent because the Hebrew word for, 
Weeks in Dan 9 colon 24-27 is also used to describe literal weeks in the Old Testament, and yet the 70 weeks, 490 days, in this text apply the year, day principle and equate to 490 years. The same refers to the Greek word for days, in Revelation 11 verse 2 and Revelation 12 verse 6 which is also used to describe literal days in the New Testament and yet the 1,260 days in these two verses are regarded as 1,260 years. These examples show that terms describing both literal time and symbolic time can be used interchangeably in scripture, and thus reveal the inconsistency of the literal day argument. Therefore, the use of the Hebrew word for literal days in Dan 12 colon 11 12 does not necessarily require that the 1290 and 1335 days are literal days to be fulfilled in the future. Nevertheless, let us assume that those who believe that periods used in Daniel 12 can be treated as literal days are right. In such case, if Christ is to return in the fall of 2027, then we need to count back literal 1260 days, see chapter on Daniel 12 verse 7, and literal 1335 days, Daniel 12 verse 12. As a result, in both cases this application would lead us to early 2024, with a 2.5 month difference, possibly indicating the end time events such as the Sunday law enforcement and the beginning of the time of trouble. It is also possible that at that time, as Ron Wyatt believed, the Ark of the Covenant containing the Ten Commandments, found by him in the Garden Tomb area in Jerusalem, will be taken out of the cave and shown to the world as a testimony. Revelation 11 verse 19. Assuming that this application is correct, then from now, end of 2022, there would be only over one year left till the spring of 2024. It seems to be a very short time. We can't say it is impossible as we are told that we are going to be surprised by the rapid development of the final events. In addition, we clearly see the constant efforts of the current Pope to push the Sunday law using the fake climate change hysteria argument and other tools. Therefore, it is very possible that the Sunday law could be enforced in America sooner than we think. Nevertheless, if autumn 2027 is too early for the Second Advent, we can also take into consideration the autumn of 2031, suggested in the next chapters as another option. In this case, we may expect the beginning of the final event in 2027 to 2028. The people of God need to study what characters they must form in order to pass through the test and proving of the last days. Many are living in spiritual weakness and backsliding. They know not what they believe. Let us read and study the twelfth chapter of Daniel. It is a warning that we shall all need to understand before the time of the end. Ellen G. White, Manuscript Releases, Volume 15, 228. Future Application of Literal Days in Daniel 12. As Seventh-day Adventists we believe that there is a typical historic application, generally accepted, of the three periods of Daniel 12 as years, 1260, 538 AD-1798 AD, 1290, 508 AD, 1798 AD, and 1335, 508 AD, 1843 AD, that overlap each other. However, as previously explained, there appears to be also a second, additional and new, historic application. Applied to Daniel 12 verses 11 to 12 this new application is more convincing when it is understood as a combination of the two last periods of 1290 years, 599 BC, 561 AD, and 1335 years, 561 AD. 2027 AD, and not just overlapping the three prophetic periods. 
In Daniel 12 it seems to be a more reasonable interpretation because it fits the context of the end of the great final persecution and the second advent. This second, new, understanding of the two prophetic periods of Daniel 12 verses 11 to 12 also seems to match the expression time, times, and half a time in Daniel 12 verse 7 if we interpret it as the literal three, five years of the final persecution that ends at the second advent. The above new interpretation, consisting of the combination of two long prophetic periods of 1,290 plus 1,335 years and the literal 1,260 days, three, five years, provides us a justification for the suggested above by Arthur Steele possible connection between the prophetic periods and the additional application of Daniel 12 proposed by Steely due to the fact that the very last word, days, has been written in two languages, Hebrew and Aramaic. However, according to some popular Adventist preachers, such as pastors Kenneth Cox, Doug Batchelor, and Richard Gates, there might be also another additional application of the three prophetic periods of Daniel 12. 1,260 days, 1,290 days, and 1,335 days. They believe that all those three periods can be also treated as literal days and as such, they may point to the last events of the world's history just before the second advent. There is only 30 days and 45 days different between them possibly signifying three different events. Pastor Kenneth Cox, the popular Seventh-day Adventist evangelist, wrote a book on Daniel in which he expressed his belief that the days of Daniel 12 are literal and should be applied in the future. An understanding of this time element will be given to the righteous during the time of the end, 12 colon 9, or after 1798. Daniel did not understand the angel's use of the time elements. Always before, a day had represented a year. But in this case, the angel used literal, and not prophetic time. Always before when speaking of prophetic time Daniel used different Hebrew words. In Daniel 7 verse 25 in the original Hebrew, it is Idin or year. In Daniel 8 verse 14 it is Ereb Boka, or evening morning, 2300 day prophecy. However, when the angel tells Daniel, but you, go your way till the end, for you shall rest, and will arise to your inheritance at the end of the days, 1213, he uses the word yam which is used in connection with literal days and not prophetic. This word is used by Daniel in chapter 1 in verses 12, 15, 18, concerning the ten-day test he and his companions faced regarding their diet. In Daniel 6 verse 7 it is used for the 30 days of royal decree. The word yam is used in the book of Daniel only when referring to literal time. Therefore, to be consistent we must conclude that the 1260, the 1290, and the 1335 days of Daniel 12 verses 11 and 12 must be literal days. pp 149-150 Treating the three prophetic periods of Daniel 12, 7, 11, 12 as literal days, we need to apply them to the end of the 6,000 years as according to Daniel 12. They refer to the end time events directly before the second advent. If the autumn of the year 2027 is to be the time of the end, then 1,335 days would begin in early 2024. The 1,290 days about one, five months later, and the 1,260 days another month later. Each of the three periods is believed to mark different events, possibly the Sunday law, outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and the beginning of the time of trouble ending in the fall of 2027 when the special resurrection will take place, and when God will announce the day and hour of Christ's coming. The below chart is an example of the literal application presented by Pastor Doe Batchelor in 2015, although, in his 2018 video on the same subject, Daniel 12 Prophecy, 
he didn't seem to uphold this interpretation anymore. I've never heard Pastor Kenneth Cox confirm giving up on the idea of the literal interpretation of the three prophetic periods of Daniel 12. Nevertheless, even though we can't be sure this understanding is correct, yet if the autumn of 2027 is the time of the end, then using the below chart we could assume that the Sunday law, which marks the beginning of the final events, could take place around the spring of 2024. In this case, according to the original interpretation by Doe Batchelor, during the first three and a half years since the Sunday law enforcement, we would live in a period of the small time of trouble, followed by only two and a half months of severe persecution between the death decree and return of the Lord. Obviously, this idea, although possible, is only a hypothesis as it is impossible to prove that this idea is correct. For more details, please watch the video by Pastor Batchelor. Some Adventist sources suggest that shortly prior to 2024, possibly in 2023, an early, mild Sunday law could be introduced based on the new environmental legislation but with no religious or worship reference. The video by Dr. Norman McNulty suggests the following stages of the development and implementation of the Sunday law. 1. Refrain from working on Sunday, 9T 232-233, CT 550551, may not be enforced. 2. On a Sunday, but can still worship on Sabbath, GC 608, enforcement may start. 3. Cannot worship on Sabbath, only Sunday, GC 607, fines and imprisonment imposed. 4. Death penalty to those who worship Sabbath and disregard Sunday, a Revelation 13 verses 15 to 17, GC 604, 621, 635. Spirit of Prophecy on Daniel 12. His, Daniel's, wonderful prophesies, as recorded by him in chapters 7 to 12 of the book bearing his name, were not fully understood even by the prophet himself, but before his life labors closed, he was given the blessed assurance that, at the end of the days, in the closing period of this world history, he would again be permitted to stand in his lot and place. It was not given to him to understand all that God had revealed of the divine purpose. Shut up the words, and seal the book, he was directed concerning his prophetic writings, these were to be sealed, even to the time of the end. Go thy way, Daniel, the angel once more directed the faithful messenger of Jehovah, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Go thou thy way till the end be, for thou shalt rest, and stand in thy lot at the end of the days, Daniel 12 4 9, 13. As we near the close of this world's history, the prophesies recorded by Daniel demand our special attention. As they relate to the very time in which we are living, she believed the second advent was to take place in her lifetime. The wise shall understand, verse 10, was spoken of the visions of Daniel that were to be unsealed in the latter days. PK 547.1, 22. How are we to understand the phrase, at the end of the days? Ellen White explains that it means, in the closing period of this world's history. Should we then conclude that the closing period of world history is the ending of the 2300 years, and the associated events of 1844? No, 1844 was not the close of this world's history. Therefore, Ellen White placed the prophecies of Daniel 12 in the future. As we near the close of this world's history, the prophecies recorded by Daniel demand our special attention, as they relate to the very time in which we are living. Ellen White often relates the last day events to her times as she believed that Christ would return in her lifetime. In the above text, referring to Daniel 12 verse 13, Ellen White wrote that Daniel would again be permitted to stand in his lot and place. This is exactly what the book of Revelation says about the little book of Daniel 12 that was to be used to prophesy again.
Before the end time, Revelation 10 verses 8 and 11. And the mighty angel, Jesus, said unto, The last generation, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples, and nations, and tongues, and kings, Revelation 10 verse 11. There are similarities between Revelation 10 verses 4 to 11 and Daniel 12 verses 4 to 13 such as sealing the prophecy, Christ lifting his hand and swearing concerning the time. It is therefore possible that the little book, Rev 10 colon 2 8 9, may also refer to the last chapter of the book of Daniel. Also, the words, you must prophesy again, Revelation 10 verse 11, refer to Daniel prophesying again through the last chapter of his book in the end times, and through disclosing the meaning of the three prophetic periods of Daniel 12 that were sealed until now. The book that was sealed was not the book of Revelation but the prophecy found in the last chapter of the book of Daniel related to the last days. Now, as Ellen White predicted, at the end of the days, in the closing period of this world's history, Daniel is, again permitted to stand in his lot and place. It is now, in the end times, that the prophecy of the last chapter of his book is being unsealed and understood. It is interesting that the seven thunders, Revelation 10 verses 3 to 4, were sealed up like Daniel 12 prophesies. It is, therefore, possible that the seven thunders relate to future events which will be disclosed in their order as a result of unsealing Daniel 12. Daniel shall stand in his lot again at the end of the days and unseal the last prophetic periods known in Revelation 10 as seven thunders. Ellen White clarifies that, the prophetic periods of Daniel, extend to the very eve of the great consummation, in the scripture are present truths that relate especially to our own time. To the period just prior to the appearing of the Son of Man, the prophesies of scripture point, and their warnings and threatenings preeminently apply. The prophetic periods of Daniel extending to the very eve of the great consummation, throw a flood of light upon events then to transpire. None need remain in ignorance, none need be unprepared for the coming of the day of God, RH 25-83. Notice that in the above quote she says that Daniel brings us to the great consummation, which is the second coming. It is Daniel 12 that brings us to the final events, the time of trouble, and the resurrection. Daniel stood in his lot to bear his testimony which was sealed until the time of the end when the first angel's message should be proclaimed to our world. These matters are of infinite importance in these last days, but while the many shall be purified, and made white, and tried, the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand. Dan 12:10. The book of Daniel is unsealed in the revelation to John, and carries us forward to the last scenes of this earth's history, TM 115.3. According to this statement, the prophecies of Daniel, chapter 7, 8, 9, were sealed until the time of the end, leading to the year 1844, but in addition, it was going to be unsealed again, Daniel 12, and lead to the last scenes of the earth's history. Now is the time to unseal Daniel 12. This assumption can be confirmed also by the following statement, The Lord has shown me in vision, that Jesus rose up, and shut the door, and entered the Holy of Holies, at the seventh month 1844, but Michael's standing up, Daniel 12 verse 1, to deliver his people, is in the future. This will not take place until Jesus has finished his priestly office in the heavenly sanctuary, WLF 12.5. I saw a throne, and on it sat the Father and the Son. I gazed on Jesus' countenance and admired his lovely person. The Father's person I could not behold, for a cloud of glorious light covered him. I asked Jesus if his Father had a form like himself. He said he had, but I could not behold it, for said he, if you should once behold the glory of his person, you would cease to exist. Before the throne I saw the Advent people, the church and the world. 
I saw two companies, one bowed down before the throne, deeply interested, while the other stood uninterested and careless. Those who were bowed before the throne would offer up their prayers and look to Jesus, then he would look to his father, and appear to be pleading with him. A light would come from the father to the son and from the son to the praying company. Then I saw an exceeding bright light come from the father to the son, and from the sun it waved over the people before the throne. But few would receive this great light. Many came out from under it and immediately resisted it, others were careless and did not cherish the light, and it moved off from them. Some cherished it, and went and bowed down with the little praying company. This company all received the light and rejoiced in it, and their countenances shone with its glory. I saw the Father rise from the throne, and in a flaming chariot go into the Holy of Holies within the veil, and sit down. Then Jesus rose up from the throne, and the most of those who were bowed down arose with him. I did not see one ray of light pass from Jesus to the careless multitude after he arose, and they were left in perfect darkness. Those who arose when Jesus did, kept their eyes fixed on him as he left the throne and led them out a little way. Then he raised his right arm, and we heard his lovely voice saying, Wait here, I am going to my Father to receive the kingdom. Keep your garments spotless, and in a little while I will return from the wedding and receive you to myself. Then a cloudy chariot, with wheels like flaming fire, surrounded by angels, came to where Jesus was. He stepped into the chariot and was born to the holiest, most holy, where the Father sat today. There I beheld Jesus, a great high priest, standing before the Father. On the hem of his garment was a bell and a pomegranate, a bell and a pomegranate. Those who rose up with Jesus would send up their faith to him in the holiest, most holy, and pray, My Father, give us thy spirit. Then Jesus would breathe upon them the Holy Ghost. In that breath was light, power, and much love, joy, and peace. I turned to look at the company who were still bowed before the throne, they did not know that Jesus had left it. Satan appeared to be by the throne, trying to carry on the work of God. I saw them look up to the throne, and pray, Father, give us thy spirit. Satan would then breathe upon them an unholy influence, in it there was light and much power, but no sweet love, joy, and peace. Satan's object was to keep them deceived and to draw back and deceive God's children, E.W. 54-56. What truth is hidden behind the great light from God that is to be accepted or rejected by us just before Christ's return? Is it possible that a part of this great light provided by the Lord just before the second advent is also associated with the three unsealed prophecies of Daniel 12? Obviously, there could be more than one truth included in the great light that is being now accepted or rejected by us with blessing or curse. The most important one, I could think of, is the fully restored gospel, the foundation of the three angel message. Revelation 14 verse 6, proclaimed by late pastor Jack Sekera. This gospel is not the same as the popular evangelical gospel, accepted by most Adventists, as it includes the complete truth of the righteousness by faith alone, Christ's true corporate incarnation, beautiful and forgotten by Adventists the in Christ motif, first preached by W. W. Prescott and adorned by Ellen White and the greatly neglected in our church's most precious truth about Jesus going through the experience of the everlasting death for us. Ellen White on Future Time Setting I believe that taking into consideration the recent events and time we live in, the message presented here agrees with God's will and plan for us. However, there is only one thing that makes me uncertain about the year 2027. My doubts are caused by some statements written by Ellen White. Let us then take a look at those texts trying to understand their meaning, and the reason why they seem to discourage believers from setting the time of the end. Great Controversy, pages 456 to 457, 
some were led into the error of repeatedly fixing upon a definite time for the coming of Christ. The light which was now shining on the subject should have shown them that no prophetic period extends to the second advent, that the exact time of this advent is not foretold. But turning from the light, they continued to set time after time for the Lord to come, and as often they were disappointed. Many Adventists have felt that unless they could fix their faith upon a definite time for the Lord's coming, they could not be zealous and diligent in the work of preparation. But as their hopes are again and again excited, only to be destroyed, their faith receives such a shock that it becomes well nigh impossible for them to be impressed by the great truths of prophecy. Those who persist in this error will at last fix upon a date too far in the future for the coming of Christ. Thus they will be led to rest in a false security, and many will not be undeceived until it is too late. I have been repeatedly urged to accept different periods of time proclaimed for the Lord to come, but, I have ever had but one testimony to bear, the Lord will not come at that period, and you are weakening the faith even of Adventists, and fastening the world in their unbelief, letter 38, 1888, manuscript release number 1210. One Selected Messages, pages 188 to 189, should we advance in spiritual knowledge, we would see the truth developing and expanding in lines of which we have little dreamed, but it will never develop in any line that will lead us to imagine that we may know the times, and the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. Again and again have I been warned in regard to time setting. There will never again be a message for the people of God that will be based on time. We are not to know the definite time either for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit or for the coming of Christ. The message must go, and that it must not be hung on time, for time will never be a test again. I saw that some were getting a false excitement, arising from preaching time, that the third angel's message can stand on its own foundation and that it needs not time to strengthen it, and that it will go with mighty power, and do its work, and will be cut short in righteousness. I saw some were making everything bend to this next fall, that is, making their calculations, and disposing of their property in reference to that time. I saw that this was wrong for this reason, instead of going to God daily, and earnestly desiring to know their present duty, they looked ahead, and made their calculations as though they knew that the work would end this fall, without inquiring their duty of God daily. I told the people they need not take heed to this man's theory, for the event he predicted would not take place. The times and the seasons God has put in his own power. And why has not God given us this knowledge, because we would not make a right use of it if he did? A condition of things would result from this knowledge among our people that would greatly retard the work of God in preparing a people to stand in the great day that is to come. We are not to live upon time excitement. We are not to be engrossed with speculations in regard to the times and the seasons which God has not revealed. Jesus has told his disciples to watch, but not for a definite time. His followers are to be in the position of those who are listening for the orders of their captain, they are to watch, wait, pray, and work, as they approach the time for the coming of the Lord, but no one will be able to predict just when that time will come, for, of that day and hour knoweth no man. You will not be able to say that he will come in one, two, or five years, neither are you to put off his coming by stating that it may not be for ten or twenty years. First of all, in the above statement, Sister White writes about a definite time, day and hour, which can be understood as a precise time of Christ's return. But the time suggested in this article is not confident, certain, indisputable, precise or definitive, but an estimated time, with the possibility of being postponed. After these seven thunders uttered their voices, the injunction comes to John as to Daniel in regard to the little book, seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered. These relate to future events which will be disclosed in their order. Daniel shall stand in his lot at the end of the days. 
John sees the little book unsealed. Then Daniel's prophecies have their proper place in the first, second, and third angel's messages to be given to the world. The unsealing of the little book was the message in relation to time. This time, which the angel declares with a solemn oath, is not the end of this world's history, neither of probationary time, but of prophetic time, which should precede the advent of our Lord. That is, the people will not have another message upon definite time. After this period of time, reaching from 1842 to 1844, there can be no definite tracing of the prophetic time. The longest reckoning reaches to the autumn of 1844-inch, 7 BC 971.47. According to Pastor Doe Batchelor, in this statement, Ellen White doesn't say that there won't be any future prophesies, but that we can't use the 2,300 years prophecy for any future application. The reason she did that is because in her days many tied to place the fulfillment of that prophecy in the future. Please notice that she says, after this period of time, there can be no definite tracing of the prophetic time. The longest reckoning reaches to the autumn of 1844 inch. She puts the definitive article before the word, longest, making it clear that she referred to the longest prophetic period of 2300 years, meaning that there will not be any future time setting based on that specific prophecy of 2300 years. Speaking of the book of Daniel, she says, the visions he saw, will soon have come to pass, ms relative to v16, p 334, 1896, placing the fulfillment of Daniel's prophesies also in the future, after 1844. The prophetic periods of Daniel extending to the very eve of the great consummation, throw a flood of light upon events then to transpire. None need remain in ignorance, none need be unprepared for the coming of the day of God, R.H., 25-83. The Great Consummation refers to the second coming of Christ. It is Daniel 12 that brings us to the final events, where Daniel speaks of the time of trouble and the resurrection of the believers at the time of the second advent. It is also very interesting that James and Ellen White came out with a new version of the 1843 prophecy chart to replace the one William Miller had created. In their new chart of 1850, they omitted 1290 and 1335 days of Daniel 12, because those three prophecies were to be fulfilled in the future before the return of Christ. In addition, Ellen White herself repeatedly stated that this world is to exist for 6,000 years, and provided a clear basis for the estimated end of that period. She never corrected her husband after he suggested in his articles that God's people living before the second advent, should and will know the time of Christ's return. They will not know the exact time, the day and hour, as it will be announced by God the Father shortly before the second advent, but there is no doubt that the closer to the end the more aware and convinced they will be about the estimated time, possibly even the year, of Christ's return. She never corrected J. N. Andrews after he wrote, We think that at the end of 6,000 years from creation, the day of judgment will commence, the period of 6,000 years from the creation would extend to the day of judgment. And we shall also have occasion to speak of the sabbatical year and the year of Jubilee, in Lev 25, as typifying the great week of 7,000 years, 11. Please notice that the frequently used word, we, indicates that apart from him also other Seventh-day Adventists, including Ellen White, must have believed in the cosmic week idea. Another important fact is that J. N. Andrews links the cosmic week idea with the sabbatical and jubilee years, both end in 2027. One of the arguments used to condemn those who try to place the fulfillment of prophetic periods in the future is the letter Ellen White wrote to Brother O. Hewitt concerning some erroneous ideas he taught, we told him of some of his errors in the past 
that the 1,335 days were ended and numerous errors of his. Unfortunately, this statement is not clear as depending on its interpretation, it could be understood as opposing or supporting the idea of the future fulfillment of the 1,335 years, from Daniel 12 verse 12. Pastor Doe Batchelor uses the same quote as evidence that the conjunction, that, should be understood in the above quoted statement as bearing the meaning of, such as, suggesting that among the errors Hewitt held was the idea, that the 1,335 days, years, were ended. However, those who disagree with Batchelor say that if Ellen White's intention was to correct Brother Hewitt for believing, that the 1,335 days were already fulfilled, then why she did not correct other Adventist writers who believed that this prophetic period was already fulfilled in 1843, and or 1844? Why did she not reprove her husband, James White, who in 1857 stated in the review that, the 1,335 days ended with the 2,300, with the midnight cry in 1844. Anyway, even if she meant to condemn the setting of the end time in the future, that was probably because in those days it was always incorrect as this knowledge was sealed at that time, and was to be revealed just before the second advent on the basis of Daniel 12, Jubilee and sabbatical years, the cosmic weak idea and spirit of prophecy writings. She often uses the words, us, and, we, referring to those who lived in her days, almost 200 years ago. For them knowing that the second advent would take place after such a long time would cause disappointment and could encourage carelessness. The opponents of those who try to figure out the time of the second advent, claim that such attempts disregard the warnings of the spirit of prophecy against the attempt of extending the fulfillment of any time prophecy beyond 1844. To prove their position they use the following quote by Ellen White, the Lord showed me that time had not been a test since 1844, and that time will never again be a test. The Lord showed me that the message must go, and that it must not be hung on time, for time will never be a test again, early writings, page 75. In this statement, Ellen White is not saying that God's people living before the end of the world's history will not be able to know the approximate time of the second advent. She only states that for true believers, time will never be a test, leading again to disappointment. She clearly refers to the very severe test the believers experienced in 1844 when Jesus didn't come on the 22nd of October 1844. Here is how Hiram Edson described the devastating feeling experienced by those who went through that severe time of test. Our fondest hopes and expectations were blasted, and such a spirit of weeping came over us as I never experienced before. It seemed that the loss of all earthly friends could have been no comparison. We wept, and wept, till the day dawn. 10. It is clear, therefore, that everything Ellen White wanted to say is that we will not have to go through the same severe time test that will result in a huge disappointment, but it doesn't mean we will not know the time of the end. Ellen White believed that the second advent would take place in her times, especially during the 1888 era as a result of proclaiming the message of righteousness by faith alone. She even wrote that the proclamation of that message in 1888 triggered the beginning of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the latter reign and that the return of Christ was at hand. Unfortunately, since the message wasn't accepted, the great blessing was withdrawn, and Christ's return never happened. Throughout the history of Christianity God never forbade his people to believe that the second advent was to take place in their time. It was true also in case of the 19th century Adventism. For this reason, Ellen White warned certain Adventists to avoid time setting, as it would finally make some to set the time of the second advent in a far distant future, thus leading many to spiritual apathy. God gives no man a message that it will be ten years or twenty years before this earth's history shall close. 
If it were forty or one hundred years, the Lord would authorize no man to proclaim it. He would not give any living being an excuse for delaying the preparation for his appearing. For this leads to reckless neglect of opportunities and privileges to prepare for that great day. Every soul who claims to be a servant of God is called to do his service as if every day might be his last. Are my sins forgiven? Has Christ, the burden bearer, taken away my guilt? Have I a clean heart, the righteousness of Christ, by faith? Woe be to any soul who is not seeking a refuge in Christ, and conforming the character to the character of Christ. Woe be, to, all who shall in any wise divert the mind from this work, and cause any soul to be less vigilant now. Manuscript 32a, 1896, Manuscript Release Number 1308 the right interpretation of the two prophetic periods of time found in Daniel 12 verses 11 to 12 was sealed in previous times until now because if it was shown to those believers that Christ would return in a very distant future, it would be depriving them of their zeal. For this reason, even Christ's disciples and early Christians believed that the kingdom of God was to come within their own lifetime. We see this approach in Paul's writings when he describes how he himself together with other living at that time Christians were waiting for. The return of Christ, we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, shall not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the archangel's call, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first, then we who are alive, who are left, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, 1 Thessalonians 4 verses 15 to 17. Because God did not want to deprive the believers in all previous ages of that exciting hope of Christ's return in their lifetime, he let them believe in the soon Christ's return. However, at the same time, he didn't want them to set specific dates for the second advent to prevent disappointment, discouragement, and doubts. God knows the day and hour of Christ's return, and Ellen White even heard it in her first vision, but the Lord erased it from her memory. I heard the hour proclaimed, but had no remembrance of that hour after I came out of vision, selected messages, book 1, page 76, see also early writings, pp 34, 285. Obviously, the good Lord couldn't let Christians living at that time to learn that his son would return two centuries later. They loved Jesus and had great hope of experiencing his return. If they were told that the second advent would take place in a very distant future, it could encourage them to become careless and neglect the work of proclaiming the truth and preparation. Today, However, taking into consideration recent and current events, there is no doubt that we live in the very last stage of the world's history and that the end is very close indeed. God, therefore, unseals and uncovers for us now the truth behind the Jubilee, and the sabbatical years as well as the additional and more relevant to us interpretation of the prophetic periods found in Daniel 12. He does this because now it is the right time and because he wants us to recognize the urgency of the days we live in, to shake us and wake us up from sleep. The Lord let us know the time because in his mercy he desires us to understand it is the very last call, an opportunity to prepare and devote ourselves completely to him and his truth. Therefore, in our current situation, Knowing the approximate time of the end and final events can only be beneficial in encouraging spiritual revival and complete surrender to God.